Well, uh, good evening. At least it's evening with you. Um, my name's Jeffrey Hughes. I'm a professor of astronomy at Boston University, and my research involves solar physics and space weather. That's the really trying to understand how the sun and what it does uh, affects the space environment around Earth and technology around Earth. So what I'm hoping to do in the next hour or so is review that subject beginning with some of the, well, so an introduction, then some of the technical sides of, of what the sun can do to technology, and then try and go talk about some of the why it, why this happens. So this is my opening slide showing the, the sun uh, on the left, and then uh, the Earth from space, and, and an aurora, which basically just summarizes the things we'll be talking about. Why study space weather? Two reasons, but, but both equally important. One is it's a laboratory on the universe as a whole. It's the one place in the universe where we can study up close magnetic fields and how they interact with matter, particularly plasmas, ionized matter. Uh, and so it's got, we can apply what we learn there to magnetospheres around other planets, to the plasma universe as a whole. But the other reason is because we can, can, are now doing more and more in space uh, being and using space to do things we, we do on Earth. And what happens in, to the sun and our space environment is very important to that. So we begin with the sun. And this is a sim simple picture of the sun um, taken from an elementary astronomy textbook. Uh, what's important to get is that the outer layers of the sun, um, are there are several of them, um, and they're highly structured. And we'll get more into that as we go on. What does the sun send to Earth? Really, three different things. First, electromagnetic radiation, that is photons, um, across the whole electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves up to gamma rays. Uh, light travel time to Earth is about eight minutes, and we're always getting sunlight. Then the sun also gives off highly energetic charged particles, primarily protons, but also electrons and heavy nuclei, with energies anywhere from tens of MeV to GeV. They travel slightly slower than light and usually not in a direct path, so they might get here in 15 minutes, half an hour, something like that. They come very occasionally in intermittent bursts, so you'll get a storm that lasts two or three days, and then they'll go away again for another month or two and come back. And finally, there's uh, thermal plasma, that is uh, ionized gas uh, with a temperature of about a million degrees um, that's continually flowing away from the sun. It's a continuous flow, but it's a very gusty flow. So the speed varies, the density varies. Um, it's, it's always changing. And the, the gas, the plasma drags with it magnetic field from the sun, which by the time it gets to us, we typically call the interplanetary magnetic field, or IMF. Sunlight is very constant. The graph on the right here shows the energy coming from the sun uh, as a function of time over the last 30 years or so. And if you look at the scale on the left, you'll see it varies very little. That scale varies from 1360 to 1364. So the sunlight energy in sunlight varies by oh, a couple of tenths of a percent um, over the over a decade or so of which the sun changes. On the bottom of that graph, the dotted lines are the number of sunspots, and you can see the two are correlated. And the sunspots are high, uh, the energy coming from the sun is high, but it varies very, very little. The sun is extremely constant at ordinary visible wavelengths, most of the solar energy. That's not so for photons of both very short wavelength and very long wavelength. Radio waves, extreme ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, is much more variable. And it varies primarily, it varies on a short scale, but it also varies on a time scale of about a decade, the so-called solar cycle. As the number of sunspots on the sun grows and decays, so does the number of energetic photons coming from the sun, and that's important. Um, the other basic element I would say of space weather is what we call the solar wind, this continuous flow of plasma away from the sun. Uh, it's very thin, very undense. The density is uh, a few, perhaps as many as 10 protons per cubic centimeter. That's a much higher vacuum than we can possibly make on Earth. 
um, temperatures of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 Kelvin, and it's moving fast. It moves at 400 kilometers a second. Uh, so it gets from the sun to the earth in two or three days. Um, but it's highly variable. And the picture on the right is showing what's called a coronal mass ejection, a burst of uh, often extra fast plasma in the solar wind in training usually stronger magnetic fields with a, with a structure of twisted up field lines. These are two pictures of the sun taken at about the same time on the upper left, the sun in white light. That is just as an ordinary camera would take a picture of the sun. You can see a few sunspots, but otherwise the sun is pretty uniform, same color all over. On the right is the sun at the same time, uh, taken an Im image taken in extreme ultraviolet, a wavelength of uh, 284 angstroms that comes from a line of a highly ionized iron that exists at a temperature of about 2 million Kelvin. You'll see that it's highly structured. There are very bright patches. There are darker patches, particularly uh, near the top of the image, near the North Pole of the Sun, but also further uh, in, at southern latitudes too. The very bright patches, which are caused by magnetic active regions, uh, correspond to where the sunspots are in the other image. You can look carefully. You'll see each bright patch on the right corresponds to dark image on the left. So these sunspots are magnetic areas that um, come and go on the surface of the Sun and are it's these magnetic fields that are the cause of space weather. It's a picture of the sun uh, over a couple of weeks. Uh, you can see that at these wavelengths, uh, which is corresponding to a temperature of about a million and a half degrees, the sun is forever changing. Um, there's a patch on the bottom of the sun that's now going to lift off. It just did. Um, now you can look up at the top left-hand side and see moving loops which are caused by changing magnetic fields. It's the hot plasma on the field lines that's actually showing us where the magnetic fields are. So this picture is basically just to show you that the sun is incredibly dynamic in the outer atmosphere, and much of this dynamics is controlled by the magnetic field. If we go a little closer, this movie shows what's called a solar flare. We're now looking at a small, smaller patch on the surface of the sun, and energy is released rapidly, heating up the plasma, making it glow in this wavelength. And you can see the what's called an arcade of magnetic loops, uh, making like an, an archway passage. Um, and these loops appear to grow, uh, and all that's uh, what you can see associated with an intense energy release on the sun that reconfigures the magnetic geometry uh, and allows these coronal mass ejections um, to leave the sun's surface. Okay. And now what happens when they leave the sun's surface? The sun is in the center of the image, hidden behind a disk to, to stop the bright light from the sun overexposing the image. The sun is the size of that little white circle. So we've blocked out light from the sun and near the sun. Uh, this image takes us out to about half the, halfway to Mercury, away from the sun. Um, again, time, uh, date and time are on the bottom, so you can see hours clicking away very fast and it lasts for several days. But the point I want you to get is that the solar wind flow, which you can see here, is not steady. It's very bursty. There's these bursts of flow coming off. Now, this movie was taken about 10 years ago, 2002, when the sun was very active. So it is an unusually active time. But it's, other than that, this is what the sun does. It's not giving out a nice steady stream, but a very bursty one. OK. Um, we started to realize that the sun was did unusual things and wasn't steady all the time about 150 years ago, uh, when a man called Carrington uh, recognized solar flares on the sun. He saw a whitening on the sun. Didn't know what it was. Photography was not available, so he drew this picture uh, that got published at the time, pointing out near this pair of sun, this group of sunspots, white patches. What wasn't understood, but happened at the same time, uh, which we can now interpret, is that there was a magnetic recording being taken um, near London at a place called Kew. At the same time, Carrington saw these flares. Uh, there was a little blip, the one on the left indicated by the, by the red arrow. Um, this one here, you can see my cursor. We now would think the X-rays coming out in the flare, ionizing the ionosphere and affecting ionospheric current so that it caused a magnetic signature. Then, about 18 hours later, this happened with the trace going way off scale. That's when the coronal mass ejection, the kinds you just saw, uh, arrived at Earth about 18 hours later, which means it was traveling at an average speed of 
much faster than typical solar wind of four or five hundred kilometers a second. This was going at two thousand three hundred kilometers a second to get there that fast. Caused a massive magnetic um, storm, lasted a few days, saw aurora down near the equator. Um, it's one of the biggest storms that's ever been recorded. So this chart tries to summarize how quickly uh, effects happen at Earth, of these different effects I've explored. Uh, basically introduced to you. Along the bottom we have a time scale going from one minute to ten days and the different rows are the different types of uh, radiation coming from the Sun or, or outbursts coming from the Sun. X-rays, radios being photons are here very quick. Um, you really get no warning for them because uh, they come at the same speed as any other signal coming, light signal coming from the Sun. Um, and might last a few from hour, minutes to hours. The energetic particles come minutes later to, to an hour later and then the solar plasma causing the big magnetic storm might come a day or two later. Uh, and so when a big event happens on the Sun you get this staggered series of things happening at the Earth. Now let's turn briefly to what can happen at Earth. Um, one of the effects that uh, causes most trouble is when you get uh, new currents flowing in the ionosphere as a result of the interaction of these solar outbursts with the Earth's magnetic field. The varying magnetic fields cause currents to be induced in the solid part of the Earth, the crust of the Earth, which is connected to the electric power grid and so can cause currents, large currents, to flow down the electrical distribution system and short it out. Uh, this, hap this happens periodically. Uh, the picture on the lower right here shows a burnt, burnt out transformer um, that was burnt out in, I believe it was New Jersey in this country, uh, <coughs> as a result of uh, a large magnetic storm causing currents going through the, the uh, wires of the power grid. This will be a, more or less a direct current rather than the alternating current that power is transmitted by. Um, a second problem is ionospheric disturbances cause uh, communications disruptions um, or any kind of radio signal that's being propagated through the ionosphere or reflected off the ionosphere. One of the technologies we're becoming more and more dependent on is the global positioning satellite system and other similar systems being developed in other parts of the world, GPS. Try to use that for very precision positioning such as a, an aeroplane using it to land on a runway. Uh, those kind of precisions uh, can get disrupted by space weather. Uh, they can also get blocked by what's essentially turbulence in the ionosphere causing scintillations, the signal to vary rapidly in both strength and phase, which leads to a loss of signal. So GPS is particularly vulnerable to space weather and the next slide simply illustrates all the different kinds of uh, uses GPS is put to these days. Uh, another industry that's highly affected by space weather, particularly uh, not so much in Europe but between North America and Asia, the shortest way to fly between North America and major East Asian cities like Beijing and Hong Kong is to go close to the North Pole, over the Arctic. But when you fly right over the very high latitude, uh, geosynchronous spacecraft which are over the equator become very hard to communicate to such that once you get above a latitude of about 82 degrees shown in the yellow circle um, you can't communicate from an airplane to a ground station traffic control by a geosynchronous satellite so they rely on high frequency HF uh, transmissions which can get uh, which do get disrupted when there's a major solar event primarily by the energetic particles coming from the Sun into the polar regions of the Earth guided by the magnetic field causing extra ionization in the ionosphere which leads to uh, absorption of the HF signals in the ionosphere. And finally we can damage spacecraft. Uh, the high energy particles trapped in the Earth's radiation belts or coming cosmic rays or energetic particles from the Sun will penetrate through uh, the surfaces of spacecraft and get to the small scale electronics deep inside uh, and can cause short circuits and uh, change memory and do other things that is not nice. This picture shows uh, on the right, uh, very much enlarged, the effect of a charged particle hitting a integrated circuit. And you can see the um, little crater created by uh, a very energetic proton hitting a circuit. And you do that to a sensitive bit of a circuit and it isn't healthy. So we lose spacecraft uh, to, to space weather damage.
And spacecraft is a big business. This shows the number of civilian aircraft uh, in orbit around the Earth at geosynchronous orbit. That's the distance where a spacecraft orbits once every day. So, in fact, so stays above the same point on the Earth, which is convenient if you're using it as a communications relay. Um, this is an old slide. There are many more now. Uh, so, uh, spacecraft uh, is is a big business, and each one costs hundreds of millions of US dollars to a billion US dollars to replace, uh, so you don't like to lose them. Okay, let's get back to why this happens. Um, what's a sunspot? This is an image of a sunspot, highly blown up. Each of those little white patches uh, over most of the diagram is a few thousand kilometers across. It's the top of a convection cell, hot part of a convection cell as the upper atmosphere of the sun is convecting. But the very dark regions, convection is uh, quenched is, is stopped by the presence of very strong magnetic fields that don't allow the gas to circulate and so they get cooler and hence darker. And so these sunspots are marks on the sun's surface caused by where intense magnetic fields penetrate, come from within the sun and come out into the upper solar atmosphere. Uh, they're dynamic. As you can see in this picture, uh, lasting a few hours, you, see, you can see the convecting cells bubbling as if it was like a pot of boiling water uh, and the sunspot in the middle. Sunspots come and go. Um, and this graph shows the so-called sunspot number, which isn't literally a count of the number of sunspots, but it's related to the number of sunspots over the past um, approximately 20 years. You can see that uh, in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002, we had a a lot of sunspots, that so-called last solar maximum. Then uh, about eight years later, 2008, 2009, 10, we had very few, a solar minimum. And now it's built up again, so that for the last two years we've had a moderate number of sunspots, but it's turned out this solar maximum has not been as active, the sun hasn't been as active um, as it was uh, 13 years ago. We're not very good at predicting this. Uh, the red line is uh, a prediction that was made two or three years ago. Didn't get it right. If we look back rather than just 10 years but over a century or more, on the bottom you see the, well this is a graph of the fraction of the surface of the sun covered by sunspots. And you can see that roughly every 11 years it gets to a maximum and then dips down again. This is the solar cycle. The most recent solar cycle uh, is over here on the extreme right. It's smaller than, the, uh, than what we've had recently, but it's not unlike what happened perhaps 100 years ago. One of these cycles around 1900 or 1910 um, might be what, what we're experiencing now, whereas 1960, we had a very big one. On the top is the same data, but showing the latitude of the sun. So we've got time along the bottom, solar latitude uh, going up the side, and the color showing where the sunspots are and how many of them are there are. And again, you can see that the current cycle is perhaps more similar to what happened 100 years ago than what happened 20 or 30 years ago. How can we see what the magnetic field of the sun's doing? You can't see magnetic fields. The outer atmosphere of the sun, the corona, the magnetic field is the dominant uh, energy density or pressure, if you like. So it controls what the plasma does. As a result, it acts very like a potential magnetic field. Um, and so on this slide, I'm showing you first a white light picture of the sun, and then on the right, a magnetogram that is using the white light from the sun and Zeeman splitting of spectral lines, we can deduce the strength of the magnetic field, which is shown by white and black, depending on whether it's pointing into or out of the sun. And you can see the sunspots are come in these pairs of a white patch and a black patch as the magnetic flux leaves the sun and goes back. We can use the data on the right to reconstruct what the magnetic field is above the sun and, in, and compare it to what the density of the material above the surface of the sun is. This is a picture of the corona. The main part of the sun is again blacked out uh, by a black disk. Um, I believe in this case it's the moon. This is done during a solar eclipse. Uh, and the white light you see is the is proportional to the electron number density uh, in the outer atmosphere of the sun. The light is caused by the electrons reflecting light photons coming from the main part of the sun. In the next picture, um, there's another such picture with 
uh, some image enhancement to show slight differences in the brightness. All these lines up here near the poles of the sun, the slight differences in density enhanced by this image uh, enhancement are in fact indicating the direction of the magnetic field. And the magnetic field here is coming out of the sun and going away from the sun uh, to interplanetary space. These darker regions, the magnetic field is in the form of loops, like this uh, or like this. And those, that magnetic field is trapping the plasma near the sun, so causing the high density. And so there's this, uh, you can get this picture from two completely different methods, taking a photograph like this or from the magnetic field, and you get the same picture. The outer region of the sun's atmosphere, the corona, is extremely hot. Uh, for many years, it really wasn't understood as a mystery as to why you could maintain such a hot upper atmosphere. Uh, even though the atmosphere below was much cooler and energy ultimately had to be coming from the sun, it seemed to defy thermodynamics. The reason is that the energy transport is not through thermal means, um, but through electromagnetic means. So this graph shows as a function of height above the surface of the sun, the temperature, which is this solid curve, reaching its coolest of a few thousand degrees uh, just above the photosphere where the light comes from in a region called the chromosphere, then over a very short region of uh, height, it increases rapidly from thousands of degrees up to of order a million degrees. And at the same time, the density shown by this dashed line falls by orders of magnitude, as you can see over here. This is the hydrogen density in atoms per cubic centimeter going from something like 10 to the 14 down to 10 to the 8. This heating occurs as I said a moment ago, electromagnetically, basically the energy is transferred up uh, through electromagnetic waves, twisting of the magnetic field. The twisting of the magnetic field puts more energy into the magnetic field, which then is released in various ways, the most dramatic being solar flares, uh, taking that magnetic energy, changing the geometry of the field and releasing the energy. The picture you get is shown here schematically and an actual photograph down below it. Magnetic field lines that have been stressed will reconnect, uh, going to a new geometry that is less stressed and have therefore less energy, uh, and releasing that energy into heating the gas and creating X-rays um, and, and other photons. This is called a solar flare. That's what it does locally. But what that can also do, if we look at this picture I just introduced on the right, the geometry down uh, near the surface of the sun uh, is similar to this. But if you uh, can reconnect these field lines at this point, the magnetic field that was holding down this structure gets cut, and so there is no longer a magnetic force keeping structures close to the sun, those dense regions in the, in the uh, corona, and they're then free to uh, lift off the sun and become a coronal mass ejection. And it's this readjustment of the magnetic field via magnetic reconnection that causes these um, coronal mass ejections to happen. At the same time, uh, you get flare signatures on the surface of the sun and bright patches on the sun. The solar wind into which the coronal mass ejection flows is continuously present. And if, one ha if you have a steady solar wind in a simple magnetic geometry such as a dipole, which is what is illustrated in this picture, start with dipole field lines and then have a flow away from the sun, the dipole field lines get stretched so that regions of them are closed, as here, and others open out as near the polar regions, uh, where a flow can will flow, where the gas will flow away from the sun. So that far from the sun, you get a continuous outflow filling all of space, uh, but oppositely directed magnetic field here in the north pointing towards the sun and the south pointing away from the sun in this, this diagram, separated by a thin region where current has to flow just from Maxwell's equations, which we call a current sheet surrounding the sun. So in three dimensions, you get a picture something like this, a magnetic field coming from both polar regions, the north and the south, uh, a region around the equator of the sun where field lines are closed, and this is where coronal mass ejections will form, and a current sheet that winds its way around the, uh, around the equator of the sun. At least that's what happens when the sun is relatively quiet. Uh, there's an awful lot of information in this slide. It's the result of 
it's data that's come from a spacecraft mission that flew at roughly the distance of the Earth from the Sun or further from the Earth from the Sun, but right, up, right around the Sun going over the poles. During the mid-90s, when this data was got, the um, red and blue indicating the direction of the magnetic field away from the Sun is clearly separated into the two poles. And uh, what this is also showing as a polar plot is the speed of the solar wind, which was high over both poles, about 700 kilometers a second, and mixed near the equator, corresponding to the closed region in the current sheet near the equator and open flow of the poles. The next time Ulysses, next orbit of Ulysses, which was, as you see, 2000, 2002, when the sun was very active, this pattern has become much more complicated. There's red and blue mixed around at all latitudes, and the speed uh, varies at all latitudes. Then the third and final time the spacecraft uh, orbited around the Sun, which was in the mid-2000s, 2006 to 2008, we went back to a picture very like the first one, except the red and the blue have switched as we went from one polarity of the magnetic to field to the other, and the Sun does flip its magnetic polarity um, every 11 years, as the Earth does on a more like a million-year time scale. So this solar wind and coronal mass ejections will come to the, towards the Earth, and I understand you've already had a lecture about the uh, coupling of the solar wind to the Earth's magnetosphere, so I will just summarize that very briefly here. Um, there is uh, very much not to scale. We have the sun on the right, uh, an indication of flow by these white lines coming from the sun. When it encounters the Earth and its magnetic field, the plasma cannot flow through the magnetic field, so it's diverted around it squeezing the magnetic field, and compressing it on the day side, the side facing the sun, stretching it out on the side face away from the sun, right side of the earth, into a long tail. This purple region here indicates a boundary between the two, which we call the magnetopause. Uh, NASA's produced a nice cartoon that, kind of, that illustrates what happens when a coronal mass ejection goes off. So here's the sun, which will be first emit a burst of x-rays, there. And now a plasma cloud, the coronal mass ejection, which will take a couple of days to reach to the Earth. And when it does reach the Earth, it squeezes the front of the Earth, reconnecting magnetic field lines there, dragging them over to the night side, the tail of the Earth, where reconnection can happen again. Electrons flow down field lines and cause aurora in the both polar regions of the Earth, around the North Pole and around the South Pole. Since you've learned about the magnetosphere, I think we can skip that picture and look at a three-dimensional picture of the magnetosphere, which is complicated. <clears throat> the Earth is here. Uh, the, the main point of showing you this picture, which is a three-dimensional picture with a piece cut out. So there's a slice being made in this plane north-south, this plane in the equator of the Earth, this plane uh, orthogonal to those other two planes, showing you different plasma populations in between. Um, I particularly want you to focus on this yellow region, so-called plasma sheet, because the next slide, which is again a movie, is going to show how the shape of this plasma sheet varies as the solar wind varies. And the main point to make is how dynamic it is. Now what we're looking at is a computer simulation done using magnetohydrodynamics of the solar wind coming in from the left. The color indicates the density of the solar wind with red, yellow being dense, uh, blue, green being less dense plasmas. The little arrow up here uh, indicates the ram pressure of the solar wind, so it's proportional to the density and the velocity. Uh, this little compass down here is showing the direction of the magnetic field in the solar wind. Or both are varying all the time. This run was done putting in, uh, these are real measurements of the solar wind to see what the magnetosphere would do. You can see this orange region here, which is where the magnetic, the solar wind has been compressed going through a shock. That's the so-called magnetosheath. And then inside a region that is generally blues and greens, lower density, which is the magnetosphere, and then this highly varying surface that's oscillating backwards and forwards, that is the surface that has magnetic field lines joined to the Earth at both ends, the so-called plasma sheet. 
The main point I want you to get out of this is just how dynamic the solar, the magnetosphere is. Even by the ordinary solar wind variations, it it's changing all the time, changing the currents flowing in the Earth's ionosphere down here that's affecting the Earth. This inset um, on the right, lower right, is a representation of what the aurora emissions might be over the northern pole. So since I've now introduced the aurora, here's a picture of the aurora taken from space. It uh, was an image taken now 20 more years ago by Dynamics Explorer 2. That's the DE2 in the, in the title. It's an ultraviolet image. The light here in the upper left is reflected solar ultraviolet light, just reflecting from the sunlit part of the Earth. It's crashing, the, the image is cut off here and here. Uh, so this would be like looking at a crescent moon. You're looking at a crescent Earth. Mostly you're looking at the dark side of the Earth uh, with part of it sunlit. This approximate circle feature here is the aurora. Unlike these, this ultraviolet, which is reflected solar ultraviolet, this is ultraviolet photons being generated in the Earth's atmosphere by electrons hitting the upper atmosphere and generating ultraviolet. On the surface of the Earth, we can see visible emissions. The ultraviolet is absorbed by the atmosphere, so we can't see ultraviolet aurora, but in space you can. And you can see that the aurora forms an, roughly a circle. Normal word used in English is an oval, uh, the auroral oval. Uh, surrounding the North Magnetic Pole and also the South, but the North Magnetic Pole is about where my cursor is now. And uh, and this oval, this circle grows and shrinks depending on how active the uh, interaction with the solar wind is, but it's always there. Associated with these aurora are currents, electrical currents flowing in the ionosphere, and it's these currents that can cause disruptions to the power grid. So when you get a big storm and the aurora move further away from the pole, down to mid-latitudes over Europe, North America, you can get power disruptions there. Um, and they're also associated with ionospheric disturbances that will uh, cause disruptions to things like GPS. And this is a movie showing the aurora over a period of uh, several hours um, over North America, and now we're just rotating into East Asia. You can see Japan coming in, and you see the aurora a dynamic. They're always you can see the aurora a very dynamic. That was a so-called substorm, an auroral disturbance that typically happens several times a day. They brighten and dim and move. Uh, so the the interaction of the magnetosphere with the solar wind is is continuous. But most of the time, it's relatively benign to technology. It's when major solar events like coronal mass ejections come and cause much bigger disturbances that um, space weather is really important. And so I will end with this picture just because it's nice to look at uh, of Aurora photographed from um, some by some people camping uh, on the snow in Alaska. Uh, very dramatic.